It's an old Shakespearean saying, the world is my oyster, though actually the wording is slightly different in Shakespeare, and what he meant by it is quite different to what the world means by it today. But it's given us a famous saying. For us, it means the, the hard bit of opening the oyster is over, now I have the delicacies provided for me to eat and to enjoy. I have everything available to me. The world is available to me. I can do whatever I like. I may even find a pearl as I eat the oyster of life that has now been provided for me. I finished school. I've done all the things that is required. I am now at the very peak. I am at my peak physical ability. I'm not talking about me at this, that's you. I'm at my peak physical ability. From 18 onwards, it's just a long, slow slide down. Sorry, some of you are over 18, aren't you? But you haven't noticed the difference yet. It's all available for me now. The world is my oyster. Uh, more commonly, you're encouraged on the way through school and through the media with that silly motivational kind of statement about you can be whatever you want to be. You just put your mind to it, put your effort to it. You can, every person can be Prime Minister, which in Australia, as we turn over Prime Ministers frequently enough, that's a possibility. We're an equal opportunities nation. Everybody can be Prime Minister of Australia because we only keep them on board for a couple of months. It really is silly old people saying to you as they look back on their own lives of missed opportunity, longing to be 18 again and to have it all and to have all the opportunities that they now see you have and giving you the useless encouragement to have a go without giving you the advice of which way to go, whatever you want to do, that's what we want you to do, which is a nonsense, of course, or without being able to give you any helpful advice about the hindrances you'll face, or how much having a go will cost you, or what sacrifices you'll have to make to achieve your goals and your aims. Just the world's your oyster. Do with it as you want to do. Have your enjoyment to be what you want to be. It's frankly fatuous nonsense. But once you've done away with Christianity, Western civilization hasn't got much wisdom to say. It doesn't tell you, I wish for you whatever you wish for yourself, which says, I haven't got the foggiest clue what's in your best interest. That's really what they're saying, isn't it? But whatever you like, that, that's, that's what will be good for you which generally is not. One of the problems that lots of first-year university students find is that they got into the course they're in because they, they got the marks to get in it. And when they get there, they find they don't actually like that course. But once you've started there, you're facing years ahead of you doing what you don't really want to do. I want to tell you that the world is more like a roundabout than an oyster. Every time you make a choice to leave the roundabout, you're choosing not to leave by two, three, four different other roads that you could go to. One of the problems I found driving around England, whereas in Australia, your roundabout generally has three or four openings that you can leave by, in England there's six or seven. And every time I choice, chose to go to this road, I saw the sign saying, you're not going to this one, you're not going to that, you're not going to that. But I wanted to go to those. But as soon as I went to that one, well, I wasn't going to this one. It's the choice of life which is killing to us how many choices there are. And I want to tell you that life is much more like the roundabout. You keep missing out on the other roads. Your priorities in life are not revealed by what you do. Your priorities in life are revealed by what you choose not to do the things that you will sacrifice in order to achieve what you want to do. That's where the real priorities are. So this morning, I want to help you with your FOMO. I want to alleviate you with your fear of missing out. 
Uh, Jesus told two parables. Come with me to Mark chapter 13. Mark chapter 13. Sorry, Matthew chapter 13. If you can find Mark 13. No, never mind. Uh, Matthew 13 is a better one to go to. Matthew 13, verses 44 to 46. Matthew 13, 44 to 46. Two little parables about the kingdom of heaven, one of them which refers to the pearl of great price. Matthew 13, verse 44. The kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in a field, which a man found and covered up. Then in his joy, he goes and sells all that he has and buys the field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant in search of fine pearls, who on finding one pearl of great value, went and sold all that he had and bought it. You... You can have your treasure, your great pearl, but only at a cost. There is no such thing as a free lunch. You have to pay for what you get in life. Therefore, you need to weigh up the cost, the benefit, the value, and pay the price or throw away that opportunity because the price is too high or because you've got something else more valuable than what you've found in the field. Okay, I'll put it into your world, because you don't go looking for pearls in fields. You can do a double degree, but the two extra years of not earning an income will cost you about $130,000, because the average graduate salary now is 65000 as you're leaving uni. So you've lost $130,000 by doing the second degree. Now, of course, you may earn marginally more because of the degree, the second degree, when you actually do graduate, though sometimes you won't, but you may. However, it will take you more than 10 years of working before you'll ever get back the $130,000 you lost by doing the second degree. And that's, of course, without counting the extra fees and the bigger student debt you got as a result of doing your second degree. It's why tradesmen who leave school at 15, 16 and start earning as apprentices, why they can afford to buy a house before a university graduate has, because those of you who have a gap year and then do a double degree, you don't actually start earning until you're 24, 25, and then you say, well, I can't afford to buy a house. Well, that's because you made a choice years ago. But you say, but I didn't make that choice. I just chose to do this. But my friends, when you chose to do this, you chose not to do that and that and that and that. But nobody tells you about the choices of what you're not doing. They just keep on promoting to you, this is a good choice to be doing. The trouble is, Everybody encourages you to try things, but they really encourage you to work out the cost, what economists call the opportunity cost, the, the cost of the opportunities that you are leaving beside. That is, the things that you're sacrificing by your choice. Now, Jesus, he has much more wisdom, honesty, and love of his hearers for he lays out the question of the choices about him, but he also says, sit down and count the cost. Before you go to war, count the cost. How big is their army? How big is my army? How many people are going to die if we go into... Count the cost. Before you build a house, sit down and count the cost, otherwise you get halfway up and then you, you run out of money and everybody laughs at you. So turn with me to Mark chapter 8. Mark chapter 8. At the end of that chapter, verse 29, where Jesus has just asked his disciples, uh, who do you say I am? And Peter answered him, you are the Christ. And he strictly charged them to tell no one about him. It's a big call when Peter says you are the Christ. For a thousand years, literally, you don't have to know dates in the Bible very much, but Jesus comes around zero. King David comes 1,000 BC. Hey, yeah, there's two easy dates for you to remember, isn't it? King David was 3,000 years ago from now. 1,000 years ago, 
God had promised King David that there would be a Christ. There would be his son who would come and rule. And so for a thousand years, a thousand years is a long time, isn't it? You know, what's a thousand years ago in our history? Well, in Australia, you've got to be indigenous to have a thousand year history, don't you, at this point? And of course, the indigenous didn't count, so it doesn't matter. Can't work out that. If you go to British history, the Battle of Hastings and the Conquest, that was 1066, that's just about a thousand, a little bit over, isn't it? Right? I mean, it's not really close by that kind of history, isn't it? A thousand years they have been waiting for the coming of the Christ to come and rule the world from Jerusalem, to come and establish the kingdom of God that would last beyond a thousand years, would last forever. To call a man a Christ was to declare a revolution because we'll have to get rid of Rome if the Christ is going to come. It's almost treason, in fact, you could... You could dob him into the Roman authorities. In fact, it's almost blasphemy to think you are the Christ. To call a man by this is a very serious thing. It's, it's to declare that this man, this actually nobody from Nazareth, Nazareth was a real nowhere place. Nothing good came out of Nazareth. I mean, you know, he came from some backwater town in the centre of, of Queensland. You know, I mean, that's where Nazareth was. It's a nothing. Uh, sorry if anyone comes from a backwater place in the centre of Queensland. We love you and we're glad. And you are like Jesus. You come from nowhere. To call this man a Christ, well, it seems extreme. We'll come back to Mark 8, but just flip over a few pages to chapter 14 for a moment. Chapter 14. Because... There you see Jesus being tried, and pick it up around verse uh, 61. Verse 61. But Jesus remained silent and made no answer. Again the high priest asked him, Are you the Christ, the Son of the Blessed? Here it is, you see. And Jesus said, I am. And you'll see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of power and coming with the clouds of heaven. Now what's the response to that? Well, the high priest tore his garments and said, what further witnesses do we need? You have heard his blasphemy. What's your decision? And they all condemned him as deserving death. For Peter to say, you are the Christ, it's not a nothing he's saying. It really is politically dangerous to be saying. It's militaristically dangerous. And so back here in chapter 8, verse 30, you'll see Jesus said, don't tell anybody about it. He swears them to silence. They weren't to tell anybody, which makes sense. You know, we're going to gather around an army. We're going to recruit in some terrorists. Uh, there were terrorists available in Israel at that time. Uh, they were known as the Sakari, uh, the dagger men. Uh, they were actually going around assassinating people. So, well, we'll better get a few of them on board, and a few people with solar swords. And all this had to be kept quiet as we get ready to defeat the Roman Empire and establish the kingdom of God. But, of course, that's not what Jesus meant. As you see in verse 31, he began to tell them the bad news of what being the Christ would mean. Then he began to teach them the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed and after three days rise again. And so here we see the disciples responding to the cross. It was Peter again who spoke for the rest. <laughs> He took Jesus aside and explained to him what it was to be a Christ, because obviously he didn't know what he was talking about. I mean, if you're going to be the Christ, you're going to conquer the world. You're going to, it's, a, it's a matter of triumph and conquest, be it by war or by politics or by economics or however you're going to set up the kingdom. It's not by being assassinated. It's not by dying. It's not by being rejected. I mean, this is just... Peter is, for many people, their favourite apostle because he keeps opening his mouth to change his feet. Anybody who talks too much loves the apostle Peter because, you know, when he really does get it so wrong. So right, you are the Christ. So wrong, not by the cross. You can't have Christ without the cross and you've got to have both the Christ and the cross. Peter's response this time was not just silly and not just wrong. It was Satan's response. But Jesus' baptism told he was the suffering servant and Satan tempts him immediately to do other things, if you remember. And so now Jesus hears in the voice of Peter, 
in the, in the advice of Peter, he hears actually the voice of Satan speaking again. Not the cross, not the cross, any other way but not the cross. Jesus didn't come to beat the Romans, but to beat Satan. He came to establish not another worldly kingdom. We've had worldly kingdoms. They come and they go and they come and they go. You know, we've seen the British Empire come. The American century has been. Now we're moving on to the Chinese century. They just come and go. No, Jesus came to bring God's kingdom, God's empire. Jesus came to win the forgiveness of, for God's people by paying for their sins. Jesus didn't come into the world for fun and games. He didn't come into the world to show you how to live. He didn't come to make you happy and healthy and wholesome. He didn't come to fight the Romans. He came to save sinners. That's why it's so relevant for you and for me, because that's what we are. He did it by his death. That's why it's so relevant for you and me, because it might feel like a long way away for you. It's not very long away for me now. I tell you, death comes, and it's an inevitability about it. It comes. So if anybody wants to be his disciples, they have to get with his program. <laughs> no point getting with a different program. If we want to be his disciples, we have to get with his program. And so Jesus spells out his program of his death and his resurrection and then invites people to be his disciples. Verse 34, calling the crowd to him with his disciples, he says, if anyone, that's you, isn't it? You're in the anyone. Uh, there's no one outside anyone. If anyone, if anyone would come after me, here are the three requirements that are involved. The three requirements, which actually resolve into just one, you'll see in a moment. The first one, deny. The second one, take up. The third one, follow. If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, follow me. To deny means to say no. If I denied myself an ice cream, it would be the first time in my life. I always say yes to ice cream, but theoretically, if I denied myself an ice cream and say, no, 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 I'm on a diet. I would, no, no, don't like sugar. It's very hard to work out why you'd say no to an ice cream, isn't it? It's just to say no. Well, what are you got to say no to here? You've got to deny yourself. Deny yourself what? No, no, just deny yourself. You've got to say no to self. Take up the cross. Well, what, what's the cross? The cross was a way of execution that the Romans invented to tyrannise the population. There's lots of ways of killing people. Many of them are much more efficient and a lot, most of them are a lot quicker than crucifixion. Crucifixion is a long, slow, torturous, and it's meant to be torturous, event. It could take you two or three days to die by crucifixion as you heaved up and down and lost your breath. And the people were held up there, high for all to see. This is what happens to traitors. This is what happens to pretending Christs. This is what happens to anybody who challenges Roman authority. We will put you up there and you will starve yourself of breath until you die in agony. And don't worry, the birds don't wait till you're dead before they take the flesh and pluck the eyes. And the crowds gather around and they see. If it's one of the popular enemies, they cheer and jeer. But they go home thinking, I'm never going to fight with Rome. Take up the cross, says Jesus. Take up the shame, the defeat, the horror, the persecution, the death and come follow me. Go the way I am going. Join with the program I am enjoying. Join with the one as our leader who is not going to conquer by conquest, but conquer by being conquered. Bizarre, weird idea that transforms human civilization. But that's a big story for another day. 
It's all resolved into one requirement found there in the paradox of verse 35. Whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospels will save it. Losing because of me and the gospel. Giving up your life for Jesus and the gospel, you will save it. But hang on to your life now. Say, no, I'm not going to give my life to Jesus. It's my life. I'm going to live my life my way to do as I please. Well, then you will lose it. Saving and losing life turns out to be like many other paradoxes in life. Like love. You feel unloved? Sorry if you feel unloved. We can't say come and give you a hug because of COVID. But I'm sorry that you feel unloved. Have an imaginary hug from me. But if you feel unloved, i tell you how to get loved. It's by giving it away. As long as you seek love, you will never get it. When you give it away, it comes overwhelmingly back to you. Mind you, it's got to be sincere. So if you give it in order to get it, you still won't get it. It's only when you give it without any consideration of getting it that you're overwhelmed by it. It's, it's like the paradox of happiness. As long as you seek happiness, you won't find it. But if you live righteously, you'll find happiness at every point. It's, it's quite, it's not what, it, happiness is a byproduct of living righteously. Happiness is something you pursue, doesn't matter how new your iPhone is, it never satisfies you. And then they tell you, number 13's coming, number 14's coming. And you look at yours and think, it's crummy, isn't it now? That thing that was supposed to make me happy. If you save your life now for yourself, you'll lose it. For death is the only certainty. But if you lose your life for Jesus and his gospel, you'll find life because he has died and risen to give it to you. So what Jesus requires is, is not a lot. It's just everything. That's really what it is, isn't it? Jesus doesn't look, look, try to be more moral. Just try a little harder. It's not, you know, be a good child until Christmas and you'll get your presents. The pathetic kind of view of Santa. It's not, well, you've got to do these things. Go to church each week, read your Bible every day. It's not, here's a set of rules and regulations. You keep them. See, sin is not breaking rules. Sin is making rules. It's running your own life your own way being in control, autonomy, and so Jesus says, give up being in control. Give up autonomy. Give up your life. Because it never was yours, was it? It was always God's. Where do you think you got it from? He then gives you three reasons for such extreme requirement. Three reasons which actually are one. Verse 36, for what what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and forfeit his soul? For what can a man give in return for his soul? For whoever is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of him will the Son of Man also be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with his holy angels. Uh, the first argument, the first reason Jesus gives is a profit and loss argument, isn't it? What profit a man to gain everything at the cost of his soul? Here's the questions for us, friends, and for our colleagues, and for our peers, our friends. Our... Here's the question for the world. What does it profit us to gain everything and lose the one thing that matters? Your very soul, your very life. What do you have then? You have nothing. Nothing but a coffin and a grave, nothing but a a coffin that's put into a crematorium flue and up you go into ashes and someone sticks a plaque up on the wall that nobody ever reads. Over the years, I've seen the sad and mad stories of what people have forfeited their soul for. The girl in the bed, the promotion at the office, the, the lowering of a golf handicap, the, to get the three-bedroom house in suburbia, to the boyfriend who didn't serve Jesus, the alcohol, the drugs, which gave me a quick, short happiness, but no real happiness. The list goes on and on and on of the very silly things I have seen people do in this lifetime. What profit is there 
in gaining what you want at the cost of your soul. The bloke I knew who knew the truth of Jesus, but the girl of his dreams had finally said yes to him. So he walked away from the gospel. And she dropped him a month later. How do you go back to Jesus as second best? He never could. You can't have Jesus as a default op option when, when you don't get what you want. Doesn't, your psychology doesn't work that way. Or the girl who'd sit outside the bar in, her, in his ute as his mates would bring out a beer to her from time to time as she waited and waited and waited for him to come when he felt like it. She was a strange girl. She knew the truth of the gospel. She knew this bloke inside was absolutely no good. She knew there was no future in him. And yet, and yet, she hoped, she longed, she loved for his affection when he could be bothered to give it to her. And you shake your head and you wonder, what hold has he over? What stupidity is in her hormones or her brains that she could trade her soul for him? But most people, it's not so extreme in its stupidity. Most people, it's the acceptable and highly approved forms of stupidity. Uh, they start out going to church and Sunday schools and camps and things like that. But the cares and riches of this world and the pleasures of this world slowly choke the seed and they are unfruitful. So it, it's not that at university you're going to be asked hard questions that you can't answer. Rarely ever have I ever seen anybody give up Christianity for intellectual reasons, for purely intellectual reasons. It's the distractions of life, the busyness of life, the social swirl of friends and family that make Christian fellowship too busy. Well done, you're here these days because there are other things you could do, aren't there? It's the pleasures of youth. It's the advancement in your career. If you go this, you'll do that, and then you'll go to here, and they'll take you to the London and then to New York, and, and, and nothing comes without a cost. The divided life is unlivable. So we give, our, give in to the immediate and stop living for Christ or proclaiming the gospel. And slowly your identity moves, slowly, subtly, silently, from being a Christian to being an engineer or a lawyer or an accountant to being a manager or a company director. As I climb the ladder of success to nowhere, for that's where the ladder goes to. You don't see it when you're 20, 30, but when you're 40, 50, you're at the top and you look and all you see are people 20 and 30 rising up, waiting to push you off. Senior executive spoke to me about the terror of Monday morning. He said, because you're going in every Monday morning looking for the letter which said, you now cost our, our company more money than you are worth every Monday morning. He knew the day would come when he was no longer worthwhile for them. And then what would he do? Go back to the bottom of the ladder again? His pride wouldn't let him. What is a profit to gain the whole world and forfeit your own soul? What is it in your life that is so valuable to you that you won't give it up? You won't give it up in return for the one who gave up heaven to die for you. What price do you put on your own life? So the second argument Jesus uses in verse 37 explains the first with a rhetorical question that drives the point home. Again, it's commercial transaction. It's giving in return. What can a man give in return for his soul? And the question really <laughs> requires no answer, for the answer should be obvious to us all. There's nothing. There's nothing that you can give in return for your soul. It's why there's no point in gaining the world, because your soul is more valuable than everything that you've gained. Actually, all you've done is handicapped yourself. Every possession requires maintenance. 
the two happiest days in a man's life is the day he buys his first boat and the day he sells his first boat. It's a wonderful idea until you own one. <laughs> it's just... Psalm 49. Go back to that wonderful passage that was read for us, Psalm 49. Why should you fear rich people, he asks, in verses uh, 6 and 7, you know, who trust in their wealth and boast in their abundance of their riches? Because, verse 7, truly no man can ransom another or give to God the price of his life, for the ransom of their life is costly and can never suffice that you should live on forever and never see the pit. Here's the rich man's problem. Jesus spelt it out when a rich young ruler came to him, if you remember that event. He couldn't give up his wealth to follow Jesus. Went away sorrowful. How hard, says Jesus, it is to enter the kingdom of God. It, a rich person, it's easier for a camel to enter into the, it, it, go through the eye of a needle, in other words, impossible, than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God. And the disciples then said, well, well who could be saved? They assumed that rich people would be saved, would have eternal life. But you're never rich enough to ransom your own soul from the inevitable grave, says Psalm 49. There's nothing we can give in return for our soul. There's nothing. Both the psalmist and the Jesus, though, had an answer. The psalmist answers there in verse 15, do you see it? But God will ransom my soul from the power of Sheol, for he will receive me. I am never rich enough to ransom myself out of death, but God is certainly rich enough to ransom me out of death. And Jesus? Jesus looked at the disciples and said, with man it's not possible, but with God it's possible. Indeed, more than possible, for Jesus went on to say, the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Oh yes, with God it's possible, for God's Son could and did pay the price that none of us could afford. For God's Son could and did give his life as a ransom for another, and not simply for another, but for the sins of the whole world. What does it profit a man to gain the whole world and forfeit his life? There's nothing in all the world, in all the riches, that he will ever be able to give in return for his life. My friends, nobody thinks they're rich. I've never met... I suppose I have, but I can't remember meeting many people who actually said I'm rich. But why? Because we all know someone richer than ourselves and we mark wealth on the, on the, on the curve, don't we? And as long as there's someone richer than me, then I'm not rich, I'm not like them, I'm not like them. <laughs> but of course, in Australia, even the poorest of us are rich. I mean, we're the richest in the world and we're the richest in history. No one's ever been richer than we are, really. And we have the second highest medium income in the world at the moment. You know, we have the largest houses per head of population in the world. Larger than America. That's astonishing, isn't it? We are the richest of the rich in the world today. And people are richer today than their parents or their grandparents or their any generation that's been beforehand, and we still want to say, well, we're not rich. Australia's had decades of continued economic growth. Last year was the first time in 25 years or something that we had a small little recession, and we're out of it already. And, of course, once you start university, you're starting on the escalator of wealth. That's what it's all about. The professional salaries that you are supposed to earn will ultimately be ahead of others. <laughs> the traders might start earlier, hey, but the heart specialist makes more in the end. So here we have today rich Australian Christians. That's a miracle that 
Jesus said, with man, that's, poss that's impossible. But not with God. All things are possible with God. So, are you a Christian? Have you accepted Jesus as your Christ and Lord, as your ransom from the grave? I told you what that means. That means to say no to self, to take up your cross and to follow the suffering servant in laying down your lives, your life for the salvation of other people. You have to lose your life for the sake of Jesus and the gospel in order to save it. We haven't been given our wealth, our education, our freedom, our Australian citizenship, all the things we've been benefited with. We haven't been given those to spend on ourselves. We're given all these things to spend on others because that's what Jesus does. Though he was rich in glory, yet he became poor so that we who are poor might become rich. And we must be like Jesus. I know our gathering here is inviting Christian people to come, and so most of us have come claiming to be Christian, and I'm glad. But is it really true of you? Time will tell, and behaviour and your choices will tell. Jesus' third reason for why you should give up everything follows from the first two. It is about shame now and then. For whoever is ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of him will the Son of Man also be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with his holy angels. Are you going to take up his cross and follow him? Are you willing to share in the shame and rejection of this world? that taking the cross means for the sake of Jesus and his gospel message for salvation. How much shame, how much criticism are you willing to accept in order to be the one person in your tutorial class or in your lecture class or in your lab who will stand up for the name of Jesus, in your group of friends who will say, no, no, I've got a church commitment, I'm not coming. I go to church on Sunday, I don't do that. No, I'm not going to live that way, I'm living this way. You should join me because you're going the wrong way. This year, you, people will ask you, well, what did you do over summer as you come to uni? Well, there's a hundred things you could say. I went to the beach, you know, I went camping, I did this. But will you say, I went to a conference about giving my life to Jesus by explaining it to other students like you? Would you like to hear about it? You see, we self-censor Christ out of our life because we are afraid, because we are ashamed. But rest assured, if you will not stand up for Jesus, he won't stand up for you when it really counts on that day. All Christians have to give up their lives to make Jesus known. Some of you must plan to give up your jobs and your working life to spend the rest of your life making Jesus known. Others of you must plan to give up your wealth to assist those who have gone into the world to make Jesus known. Some of us, as we heard yesterday, might wind up in Spain explaining to people, about the Lord Jesus. All of us have to give up our time and our energy to pray for each other as we seek to make Christ known. So as you start your adult life, now you're a high school graduate, heading off into university, the world is at your feet, the world is your oyster, and you may in the world find a pearl of great beauty and price. But Jesus offers you something far, far more valuable than any oyster pearl. He offers the kingdom of God. He offers forgiveness. He offers eternal life. He offers conquest over sin and over Satan. He offers conquest over death and meaninglessness and futility and pointlessness. But yet, as with all valuables, you have to value it if you are going to sacrifice other things for it. If you don't value what Jesus offers, 
you won't sacrifice anything for Jesus' name. And so his little parable of the man who found the pearl and sold all that he had in order to get this is like the kingdom of heaven. Once <laughs> you find the kingdom of heaven, you sell all that you have in order to have it. And so the requirements of those who want to be his disciples. Hang on to your life. Do your own thing. Why? That's the essence of sin. Give your life as the Lord Jesus has given his life. Submit yourself to him. Why? That is your only hope of forgiveness and salvation. But it's not something you just do in theory. That's how you live. 1959, not understanding what I was hearing or knowing what I was doing, under the mercy and kindness of God, he took my life for himself. As an old man, let me tell you, best decision I ever made. Not the slightest inkling of a regret that I have ever had for the choice that I made that none of my friends made with me. And I look at the end of life and I see how God has blessed me at every point and I look at my friends' lives and how sad they are. Yesterday we closed in prayer with a prayer from Two Ways to Live, saying that we knew that we are not acceptable by God and need forgiveness. Thank God for sending Jesus to forgive me and rise to give me new life. And then the prayer of the prayer is the last paragraph, Please forgive me. <laughs> I need forgiveness. Jesus died that I be forgiven. Please forgive me. And change me. That I may live differently. How? That I may live with Jesus as my ruler, my Lord, my King. Is that your prayer? Let's pray it now.